The ancient Egyptians had a complex belief system surrounding their dead, with intricate embalming rituals involving ceremonial ashotis and treasures to be buried with the deceased so that they could take them with them to the next life, should the heart weigh in their favour at the scales of truth. For if their heart is proven unworthy, it is fed to Amut, the devourer of the dead. <laughs> Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is a festival celebrated in Mexico and other parts of Latin America that honours and commemorates death. <sighs> Combining indigenous rituals with Catholic holiday All Saints Day, Dia de los Muertos is when the dead return to their graves having previously risen from them at Hall Hallows Eve to visit loved ones. During this time, families celebrate by preparing food and special altars adorned with decorated calavera sugar skulls and papal picado decorative designs cut into sheets of coloured tissue paper. Societies in the Western world mark their respect to the departed by means of a funeral ceremony. Where family members and friends share memories and recite poems or songs by the graveside itself or inside a place of worship. almost as a way to say goodbye to the soul or spirit of the departed. But in all civilizations, death and the possibility of an afterlife has both consumed and baffled the minds of theologists and philosophers since the dawn of humanity. But what happens to our souls when we die? In many religions and mythological traditions, the soul is the non-corporeal essence of a living person or animal. Greek philosophers such as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle understood that the soul had a logical faculty, the exercise of which was the most divine of human actions. Aristotle reasoned that somebody's body and soul were their matter and form. The body is the collection of elements to carry the soul and the soul is the essence of the person themselves. Thomas Aquinas took this view into Christianity. In some religions, such as Judaism and other Christian denominations, only human beings have immortal souls. And other religions, such as Hinduism, have the belief that all living things, from the smallest insect to the largest mammal are the souls themselves and have their physical representative in the world. The actual self is the soul, while the body is only a, a mechanism to experience the karma of that life. Thus, if one sees a jellyfish, then there is a self-conscious, self-aware identity residing within it. Some teach that even non-biological entities, such as streams, rocks and mountains possess souls. This belief is called animism. I am the rocks and the stream and the trees. Touch my pebbles and I can feel you. 
I am the birds and the clouds in the sky. Reach up to my being and believe me. I am the waking eye in the dawn of time. I am the stone and the mountain fir. I hear and see and touch and breathe higher. Wait a minute, hold the phone back up there. Did I mention something called a sugar skull? Okay, I need I can't continue this episode without at least trying to make one of these myself. Um, if I'm going to be back on camera, I need to tidy up a bit. I thought the rest of this episode was going to be voiceover. Oh, hello. Welcome to my kitchen. If you can hear a faint humming in the background, it's just my refrigerator. Ignore it. It's not an aeroplane or a bomb or anything like that. Okay, here we go. I've got the recipe. It's a really, really simple recipe to make sugar skulls. Uh, most of them call for sugar and something called meringue mix. Or if you've not got meringue mix, you can use water, but it takes longer for the sugar skulls to dry out. This recipe is using egg whites. Um, now this is the Calavera recipe that dates back to the 1630s, these records of this dated back to then. Basically, you literally just mix granulated sugar with two egg whites. Now, because I've never done this before, I'm not going to waste two eggs in case I make a right mess of it. So I'm just going to use one egg white and go as I go along. And you mix them together with your hands until it is a light sand-like texture. So let's add the sugar. You need enough sugar for a skull. Kind of obvious, I don't know why I said that. He gets an egg. Separating the eggs quite tricky. You can get all these novelty devices, but what I do, I just sort of break the shell in half and sort of pass the yolk back and forth between until you've got. I don't know if this is on camera or not, it should be. You just sort of pass the yolk back and forth like that until you've got all the snotty egg whites. Get rid of that. If you're feeling resourceful, you can save the egg yolks and use it to make, I don't know, a custard or something. Right, now you add the egg whites. This is horrible, I'm gonna get messy, aren't I? I'm not looking forward to this. Okay, you've gotta, you know I have to do it. Come on, Nathan, be butch. Mix it with your hands until it's a wet sand texture. That's what the recipe says. Let's just double read it. Yeah, until a wet sand texture. And then you roll it into a ball and shape it into a skull with your hands. Or if you've got a mold, a lot of people these days use little molds, push it into a mold. But that's very snotty. It's gonna need a lot more sugar than that. Try and do this with one hand. Because I've got, I don't want to drop it. A little bit more sugar. I'm going to leave the sugar there so I can... A bit more. It's actually a lot easier than I thought it would be. I thought it would be like making pastry. Have you ever done that where you make pastry with your hands and you've got butter and flour everywhere? I mean, you have to rub it with your fingers and it's just not combining and you're making a right mess. is working and do you know what I might actually have enough to make two or three skulls a bit more just read that okay now what you have to do is when you've done this and shape your skull you have to leave it for dry for 24 hours then you decorate it I'll decorate mine later and then you place it on your ofrenda, which is uh, Spanish for the offering, and that's just an altar in your home or in the church. Let's see what else it says in my little notebook. Yeah, and like I said at the beginning of the episode, it's like a 
com- uh, Dia de los Muertos is like a combination of the Roman Catholic All Saints Day and the Aztec and Mayan and Toltec rituals of the day. They, they sort of merged and became this. I need more sugar. Dia de los Muertos. Which, of course, everyone that speaks Spanish knows that literally means Day of the Day. This is getting very snotty and horrible. It's the texture of wet sand, but I don't think I could shape it. This must be really boring for you to watch, just me kneading a bit of sugar paste around. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump forward until I've finished. Okay, now this next bit's really simple. You get your little lump of sugar paste, and like I say, if you've got a mold, you stick that into the mold and compress it. But I'm gonna shape it by hand into a skull. Sort of make a ball. Two eyes. There. Now we leave that to dry, for, it looks nothing like it should do, but I tried my best. We'll leave that to dry for 24 hours and then we decorate it. I'm gonna have an early night because I've gotta go early in the morning to decorate my sugar skull. And also in the second half of this episode, I'm gonna talk about more funerary rites and funerary customs, as well as discussing um, various famous deaths and executions throughout history, so good night. I think I'm going to go to the Halloween party I was invited to. Again, if you hear anything untoward, it's just my washing machine on the tumble and a fast spin. It's not an explosion or a bomb going off. Why do I keep mentioning bombs? Forget about bombs. Okay, I've got my piping bags. These are special icing nozzles that you get lots of different shapes, but I'm just going to use the plain one. I've got it upside down here so that you can see what I'm doing. I'm just going to 
This icing is so stiff and really hard to push out, so I had to soak it in hot water. I'm going to go around the eyes. Some red on the teeth. I don't know if it's to do with the chemical compound in the icing, but I find the red is a lot easier to squeeze than the green. Don't know why. Nobody knows why. It's one of life's little mysteries. As we delve into the unknown. This is looking pretty good. Say that. I'm gonna try and do little dots. No, oh, I've mucked up my teeth. No, excuse me. Traditionally, you're supposed to write the name of the departed on the forehead of the person you're dedicating the school to, who you want to help find their way home from the graveyard. I'm going to just do their initials. Actually, I can't because she's got way too many initials. I'll just do her first name. I can't fit it on. It's meant to be my great-grandmother, Ethel Kate Head, Odin Fields, Nay Odiny. Whatever all of her surnames were, if you've watched the episode about seances, you'll know who I mean. Let's keep decorating, because this is fun. I'm going to go around the edge. Nope. Oh, knocking all the set dressing out of the way. Okay, I've also got these lovely little decorated they look sort of rabbits. I don't know what rabbits have got to do with Day of the Dead. I of course got them in the post Easter sale at the supermarket. They're rather cute little pink and white decorative rabbits made out of sugar. Put some around the eyelashes. Oh, I'm fell in its eye, I can't get it. And I've also got some purple sprinkles them in its nostril. Yeah, and there is my Calavera sugar skull. I'm going to stick this in my ofrenda and hopefully on Dia de los Muertos my ancestors can find their way home. Now you can also get calaveras made out of clay or coated in metal. For children they make smaller ones flavoured with peppermint and things like that or chocolate moulded ones. These sugar schools of course, the ones I've made, aren't supposed to be eaten, they're just for decorative purposes only. Why am I sinking? Traditionally, funerals are held at least three days after death. This tradition dates back to a time when medical science wasn't as advanced and death couldn't always be confirmed. The three days was to ensure that the person was dead and not just in a coma. Nobody 
wants to be buried alive. Before I leave, I wanted to briefly read up on some of the more inhumane executions in history of seemingly innocent people who at the time were charged with having unnatural powers and abilities such as witchcraft or sorcery or communicating with God. Accusations that today would be laughed out of court. Agatha was a Christian who lived in Sicily during the 3rd century, and during the persecution of Roman Emperor Odysseus, she fled from her homeland and took refuge on the island of Malta. She spent her days in the northern town of Rabat, in a cave teaching the Christian faith to the native pagan children. In the year 251, Agatha returned to Sicily, where she faced martyrdom. She was arrested upon arrival and brought before Quintianus, traitor of Catania, who condemned her to torture and imprisonment. He sent her off to a brothel to be used as a prostitute in a hope to break her spirit. When this didn't work, she was sentenced to physical torture as a way of punishment for her piety. She was stretched on a rack and her sides torn with iron hooks, her breasts cut off with pincers as she was whipped. Saint Agatha was then sentenced to be burned to the stake, but when an earthquake saved her from her execution, she was instead sent to prison where she later died. Just over a thousand years later, and roughly 1400 miles north of Italy, was the trial of another innocent woman who was executed for her beliefs. Joan of Arc was a peasant girl who was born in 1412, and while believing to be acting under the divine guidance from God, she led the French army in victory at Orleans in 1429, stopping the English in an attempt to conquer France during the Hundred Years' War. But her failure to liberate Paris followed, and on May 23rd, 1430, she was captured by the Duke of Burgundy's men and jailed for more than a year. Joan was later put on trial for a number of charges, including witchcraft and violating divine law for dressing like a man. On 30th of May, 1431, in Rouen, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake for heresy and, of course, the crimes of witchcraft. <laughs> The Lancashire Witch Trials of 1612 are among the most famous in English history and some of the best recorded in the 17th century. The majority of the witches on trial were from Pendle Hill in the northwest of England. The rest included the Salmsbury Cannibals, Janet Briley, Jane Southworth and Ellen Browley, as well as Margaret Pearson, the Paddingham Witch and Isabel Roby from Windle. Seventy years later, at the other end of the country, was the trial of Temperance Lloyd, Mary Trembles and Susanna Edwards. The three were from the town of Biddeford in Devon, where Mary and Susanna were blamed for causing a woman's illness. Temperance Lloyd was accused of conversing with the devil while he was in the form of a magpie, and multiple witnesses even claimed to have seen him feeding off her inch-long teats. She also confessed to cursing a woman's knee to bleed by pricking a piece of leather nine times. The Biddeford Witches were the last recorded women to be hanged in England for the crimes of witchcraft. And I think we can all count ourselves fortunate that times have long since changed. How many of us would have been burned at the stake long before now for the things that we get up to day to day?